I'd like to uh, go on to uh, our next speaker today. Um, I, th I think I've seen that she's joined. Her name is um, Yvonne Adhiambu Wu. And uh, she's an author and currently uh, DRD um, artist in residence. Uh, Yvonne, are you there? Um, yes. I am. I'm here. Hello. Hello. Nice to uh, nice to have you uh, in this forum. Um, Thank you. Introducing you. We'll play um, in a bit, and then you can have the mic shortly. Thank you. Kenyan-born, Nairobi-based Yvonne Adiambo Owo graduated from the University of Queensland in Australia with an MPhil in Creative Writing. She worked with Aga Khan University for three years as a programming coordinator and fine arts curriculum planner for a new, context-relevant, future-oriented liberal arts university initiative planned for Eastern Africa. She made her literary debut with The Weight of Whispers, a short story that won her the Kane Prize for African Writing in 2003. Owa has been honored by her country for her artistic and cultural contributions. She has been a fellow at different global institutions, including the International Writing Program at the University of Iowa. And now, ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming to Global Partnership for Africa's Development Forum, GPAD 2021, Yvonne Owa. Asana, thank you so much, Faith. Good morning, everyone, and thank you to the organizers of this event. Uh, thank you also for the very generous welcome. It's a profound honor to be with you guys today. My brief intervention is linked to rethinking education in Africa, and uh, my paper is actually titled Imagining Futures, Africa Education and or an Anthem for a New African Generation. It does build on some of the most provocative and frank proposals that I also heard yesterday. Uh, but this presentation, I'm warning you, is going to be a little different from what, you have, what has gone on before. Um, and uh, I guess that's, that's the risk of inviting an artist and a literary artist into an event like this. Um, so I will, I'll give this paper in, in, in three parts. First, an eagle's eye overview. Then, a series of rhetorical questions about some of our contradictions and paradoxes. And finally, a gesture to future horizons. Some points of departure. One, when I say Africa, it is to the metaphorical, geographical, and historical collective to which I refer, subsuming the Africa diaspora. We are worlds coexisting within worlds. North Africa is in this collective the present insanity that subs the Sahara is not my portion. Which Africa? Not the one the economists presumed to call the hopeless continent in 2000. Not the fantasy Africa with the iconic tearful naked child around whose eyes hover those special UN flies. Not the vast realm that is only the consumer of others' ideas and knowledge, the dumping site of their used clothes. I'm reflecting on the world's second largest continent, 20.4% of the world's land area, 6% of the Earth's total surface, 16% of the world's population, custodian of 75% of the raw materials that the world depends on, including most of the world's gold, which by the way, the rest of the world count as their own. Over 6,000 languages with distinct cultural spheres, the Africa into which all China, the US, Europe, and Canada can fit, with space to spare. A pivot to mineral-intensive energy systems means that once again, our continent and the DRC is central to powering the world's future. Against this backdrop, do I raise the questions around our educational imperatives and the implications for the future? A second departure point. Pluriversalism is a framework that undergirds this proposal because it affirms the power of our inner and outer complexities. It kicks aside a madness that the thinker Santiago Castro Gomez refers to as the hubris of point zero, uh, what you call an epistemic delusion that sometimes we still buy into 
makes us believe that all knowledge, all power, all reason, all critique, all frameworks of the world and the world itself can only come from Europe or from the West or from the Occident, whatever you want to call it. Point three, this intervention is actually just a footnote. There are so many others who have offered uh, uh, these, you have offered future inscribing treasures that should long ago have been incorporated in our policies and in our educational philosophies. Four, the future is a construct, a story that is intentionally imagined and imaged, plotted, designed, and then resources deployed so that we can act upon it. The quest for the future is a planetary competition of who will offer the most compelling story for humanity and the world, to which humanity and the world can jump and jump on board. And future, by the way, does not mean neglecting the past or history. The past and the future are, by the way, both residents of the present. Departure point five on education. What does education mean for us? What are our educational points of reference? What premises frame our educational systems? What overarching story of us do these serve? What is the philosophy that governs our educational choices? What do we project in our intellectual agenda? Do we have an intellectual agenda? The correct answers to these are nothing, nothing, not, nothing, we don't know. Education is a key battleground of and for the future. Are we aware of this? If we are, how do we, de how do we deploy education to serve our highest aspirations and ambitions? Do we even know what our highest aspirations and ambitions are? And upon which, uh, and, upon, and, and since the educational quest is linked to the cultivation of a complete human being, what does it mean for us as Africans to be human? On which structures, uh, on, on, what the, on what foundation, on what story foundations are our educational structures built? By the way, there's always a story underpinning our interventions. It is just that not, we are not necessarily the authors of those stories. In this intervention, I will harp quite a bit on, on, on the idea of imagination because I maintain that our continent pivots on two major overarching crises. And these crises inflict uh, right across the board, but particularly our educational processes. That of memory, including how, what, and who we remember, and that of the imagination. Did you think I was going to say leadership and governance? Ha! Huh. We get and endure the leaders we have, we imagine, don't we? They are the byproducts of the story we have come to believe about ourselves and what we deserve. Do allow me one minor act of vandalism. For the duration of this presentation, I shall avoid your phrase sustainable development. You see, I'm a reformed and repentant former development professional with an MA in the same. The phrase sustainable development became a trigger word that turned me into a writer of fiction instead. The minority world, what you guys call the global north, reserves and insists on that phrase for a fantastical global south. For themselves, you're most likely going to read phrases like future trends, future proofing, or strategic words that suggest wealth, power, agency, agency, and civilizational impetus. Borrowing inspiration from a bold new generation and re-echoing our Eliud Kipchoge's No Human is Limited, I am personally done with being tentative about Africa's ambitions. Words have power and a prophetic imperative. The other faint praise words that are suspended from my presentation and, and are usually associated with Africa include potential, enduring, emerging, and resilient. Back to education. When was the last time you gave thought to how the exercise of education is a ritual? A series of initiatory rites that unfold a story through which a human being, in this case the African being, crosses or doesn't cross into a fullness of humanity. In the absence of an investment in our story making, our own myth making, whose story then do our educational processes guide us into? 
And is there anything in this story that offers us a vision of ourselves as extraordinary and destined to inscribe our lives into the galaxies? What in our educational imagining sets out to offer a reply to the most fundamental of questions concerning our reality? One, what does it mean to be human? Two, what does the humanity of the other mean for me? A support question is what is an embodiment of the ideal to which we off and in Africa move towards? If we have not answered these questions ever, if these questions have not shown up in our Ministry of Education blueprints, what then is the purpose of our educational interventions? Which African stories again do they serve? Do you know? I tried to find a comprehensive multi-generational scope intellectual agenda for our African nations. I thought I might find the philosophies that actually do infuse our curricular choices. I had a slide showing the Kenya 2004 Ministry of Education, Science and Technology stated philosophy of education in Kenya. I had better not embarrass my people publicly. I'm sure they meant well, uh, but the road to hell is paved with good intentions. The South African one is only slightly better. It just uses more on-trend words. The Algerian one at least has a spiritual and moral underpinning and links this to giving learners the capacity to live in the world. Now contrast this with the South Korean one that starts like this. The objective of education under the ideals of Hongik Ngan, the founding philosophy of Korea. Hongik Ngan is the unofficial Korean national motto and the official educational motto. Its English translation is to broadly benefit the human world. Transcending the boundaries of ideology and religion, Hongik Ngan is recorded in history as part of the and part and parcel of the, uh, the Korean founding story, the founding mythology. It contains the aspiration of the Korean people projected out into the world, into the universe, that they would build a nation that, that lived for the benefit of humanity. It doesn't take much, does it? What are the founding values and laws under which our existing ex educational systems live and move and have their being? Is that why we often build our educational edifices on, on shifting sand? Our universities are exhibit A. I now hear STEM has become an African clarion call, but not a single day has been spent exploring what science, technology, engineering, and mathematics actually mean for our context and continent. We pretend to ourselves that these are universal right and that we are part of that universe. We then rationalize the humanities and fine arts until they disappear, not once recognizing that our most urgent need is that of educating our fragmenting and shriveling imagination and senses. Yet it is a, yes, it is a thrill to solve an equation well, but it is even more powerful to be able to invent equations for the world to solve. Yesterday, some of the contributors spoke of the need to expand and increase the educational services in Africa. You know yourselves that our continent is replete with engineers, doctors, teachers, actuarial scientists, and biotechnologists who are working in quarries, who have to leave home in order to try to dream. We discard our gifted, shun them, and for some of the most primordial reasons, a story we tell ourselves, they are not our ethnicity, nationality, race, clan, or creed. Our African refugee camps host fellow, uh, fellow African musicians, visual artists, designers, teachers, scientists who have no way to exercise their skills because hashtag rules and regulation. Our leaders are shameless about outsourcing skilled citizens to strange nations and are all equally oblivious to the sight of our bodies, the bodies of our people floundering and dying in foreign seas or being traded with for body parts or being enslaved and indentured in, slave, in strange lands. Our primary educational predicament, I argue, is not about the quantity or quality of our education. It is in our epistemological framing, our will to be irrelevant to our context, and the fact that rarely do we ever work with an intellectual agenda linked to a philosophy, a story, or a myth of us. We have not adapted our educational initiatives yet to strategies and visions that anticipate how our people can locate themselves in the continent and the world and flourish into perpetuity. Now, when you hear the word future, what comes to your mind? I know some of you had a flash of Wakanda, delete it. 
Others imagined a soaring city and thought to themselves, Dubai, stop it. Du Dubai imagined Dubai for Dubai about 20 years ago. The Dubai you now so greatly admire come from a vision, a story, a mythology Dubai created for itself about what its future meant for its people. We are the proverbial eagle chicks raised and tolerated by chicken, who occasionally raise their heads and see great eagles and admire the, their dominance of the skies and their harnessing of the winds and their command of the earth too, without ever realizing that we're looking at ourselves, who we truly are, unaware of the tragedy. If we are fruitful, we raise progeny that act, think, and self-identify as chicken too, who will squander their future energy arguing, arguing with other chicken about the rights of chicken and go to courts to fight to be recognized as speckled kitsch or chicken and all the time fighting for small portions of grains scattered on the soil. But now in a historical zeitgeist offers us an unprecedented chance to seize new opportunities to design the frontiers of our future. A civilizational pivot is underway, as is also the threat of the death of our planet. The culture that imagined our humanity to this point, they know themselves. Anyway, the major, the major flashpoints for the climate crisis are also, by the way, unlikely going to point only in the direction of the global south, given what has been happening right now uh, for the last five years in Europe, America, Canada, and elsewhere. Floods, fires, volcanoes. We are also living through the phenomenon of COVID-19, a harbinger that is also presumably connected to the changing climate. What did we witness? The repudiation of human solidarity, the will to profiteer and commoditize even suffering, primordial instincts to try to assert spurious national, cultural, tribal, and racial superiority on the basis of vaccine availability. Uh, you can see how silly, uh, how, how low the depths, even, even the most elevated thinkers can descend. But what becomes clear, what becomes certain is that a new planetary moral and conceptual imperative is required to stabilize our humanity. We can enter the game, but will we? China, bless their imagination, has shown up quietly in this epoch as a powerful protagonist in the story of the Earth and its future. Its presence incites hilarious discombobulations and squeaking by those threatened in, by, by a twilight of their hegemony. Tragically, it might lead to a great war. But what is more important for us is to look at China, whose GDP only 40 years ago many of our countries surpassed to whom 40 years ago, some of our countries were sending donations. So how did China in about 20 years move 800 million citizens from dire poverty, starvation and ignorance into wealth, intellectual heft, influence and global power, and do this with fewer resources than we have as a continent? But what educational imperatives also have we instituted to ride this wave, to learn this wave, knowing that old wineskins cannot sustain new wine poured into them? The site of global geopolitical contestations as a consequence of China's rise has now moved for into the alleged Indo-Pacific, a realm where East Africa has, a deep, it has deep and wide stakes. What have our own continental processes, including educational processes, done to anticipate this? So that when our people here in the Pacific, and when I say our people, I mean all Africans, they know that they need to snap, snap wide awake. The forces of technology, artificial intelligence, the internet of things, virtual and augmented reality, and other immersive technologies that challenge even our assumptions of memory, the harnessing of cultural and creative assets to generate content and build intellectual property assets, financial technology and mobile banking all have tectonic implications to how we structure our educational interventions, to how we position ourselves in the world, to what philosophy we put together in order to articulate and project ourselves. Now, let us pivot to our various African ministries of education and the universities, where our best minds are busy with formulating an intellectual agenda that will propel us as main protagonists in the world of the future. My apologies, that was a grim joke. Let me gesture again to Korea, South Korea. It willed its own stratospheric rise. It offered itself to the world through what it termed Hallyu, 
Reality follows intent. When a people start to read, see, hear, and write themselves as beautiful, good, true, powerful, able to transcend their worst wounds, and lovable, they remake themselves, they remake their world, and, and the rest of the world follows them. From intentional seeding, it seems, a future that is imagined needs only 20 years to show up. What I'm trying to say is that our educational renewal, actually our continental renewal, means bugger all in the absence of a collective, intentional African human and future-making project, a project that restores the meaning of our African existence and reinstates and amplifies our projected mythological selves. So let me ask you again, what are our spirits most hungry for? Do you know? What is Africa's mission to itself, to humanity, to nature and the universe? Is the sense and yearning for grandeur still within us? And what would it take to have educational processes that offer a vision pipeline that consolidates our sense of self and a grand moral vision that prioritizes us? Others speak confidently and with certainty of their intent to lead the race to the planets, yet all their materials for their, for their space vessels come from the DRC. But us? Why do we settle for sustainable development when we can justifiably imagine ourselves as dominating the world? I get it. An exhausted continent hounded for more than 500 years to near extermination might evolve into a spineless, toothless, smiling void in order to cling to whatever life is allowed it. And yet, and yet, so rarely do we acknowledge this. We are not mere survivors, we are super survivors, diamond beings born out of centuries of preternatural pressures and adversity, and who seem to have not thought enough to harness their immense and sublime superpowers for their benefit, who waste that power by turning instead within to cannibalize themselves, as Dr. Folari noted yesterday. But we are still here. We are people who experience an Amagadonian loss of worlds before marauders who thought it was enlightened to try to exterminate human beings for sport and steal their land, their lives, their art. And despite the horrors, we are still here. To have watched immense patrimony stolen, survived genocide and despotic regimes, to have existed in a world that then deployed its imagination, its media, its story makers, and their intelligentsia to construct tomes about our non-humanity, all of this, and we are still here. We are imbued with the largest of Earth's wings made for adventures within and without. Why would we succumb to non-dreaming? We are here, the children of the children once written off by Hegel, no less, as non-existing. Yet here we are. We are the custodians of the world's most potent weapon, a coveted treasure, a youthful generation with limitless imagination and boundarylessness. Boundary Their tendency to self-reliance and willingness to settle for barely just enough. These young people, they know, they see, others see them too. They're invited to France, to Marseille to speak and offer ideas to President Macron and his people who they think have their interests at heart because they at least, he at least offer, offered them a forum where dreams of the future, the ones they keep in their hearts could be heard. There they were told they are architects of the future but before or since then, has a single African leader arranged a summit for these young uh, to just to hear them out? You see, we see what is before us and then we don't see, right? Yet what can we do? What do we do? A friend from Singapore, Dr. Pang, directed me to Stephen Hawking's notion of cathedral projects, which author Margaret Heffernan amplified in her book, Uncharted, How to Navigate the Future. These are projects, cathedral projects are projects destined to last longer than a human lifetime, to adapt to changing tastes and technologies, to endure long into the future as symbols of faith and human imagination. These projects challenge to the utmost our capacity to imagine and adapt to a future we can't see or predict. Dr. Pang observed to me, if we, the majority world, do not embark on our own cathedral projects. We are doomed to serve someone else's. He said it was necessary that we build connections that span geographies to intentionally create alliances across space and time as a matter of urgency if we intend to become protagonists of a future of our designing. 
A cathedral project is rooted in the humus in which it is founded. It has inner and outer eyes fixed upon the world and eternity. It is multi-pronged, multifaceted, multi-layered, multi-generational in scope. It has no end date. It is organic. It turns its discoveries into lesson plans. It makes mistakes, but it does not dwell on its failures. It aspires to, trans to transcendence, to reaching eternity. It is loyal to the quest for meaning, for beauty, for goodness, for truth. If we, the Africans, ached for our transcendence more than our learned greed, lusts, dependencies, and fears, if we realized the call of our continent as a kind of cathedral project, we could easily summon a billion new minds, hearts, spirits, and dream dreams for a vision of knowledge and of us, a story of us that, that would power the world literally and figuratively. Our priority is intra-African, for we need to blur those most stupid limiting boundaries. The African continental free trade area is a signal in the right direction. Nothing is more urgent now than our opening up our intern the internal territories of our being, of ideas, of imagination, of theories of knowledge. We need to meet, be able to meet and to interact with ease. The educational imperative has to be continuous, collectivized and shared if we want the future, for we cannot do it alone. It cannot be left to the designated ministries, by the way. So, finally, to you, what does Africa, that is you, what does Africa imagine for itself and for humanity? What is your first sentence in the story of us? What is the image in the first line of that story of us? Does it echo and reply to our deepest longings for ourselves and for our humanity? In which case, my dears, what does it mean for you, for us, to be human and African and limitless? You long for a renewal of our educational ecologies, in our cherished continent, well, that which you have just imagined is where the future begins. So thank you. <laughs>